So we'll talk about some of the general effects of um, opioids as a class of medications on the central nervous system. So we basically give opioids to people because we want them to have an altered sensorium or, or decreased sensation to nociceptive information. So altered or decreased sensory perception of, no, of noxious stimuli. And this actually happens at multiple different levels, as I'll show you when we talk about sites of action. But not only is the uh, pain information or nociceptive information blocked to a certain degree at the spinal cord, but the way your cortex processes um, this information and establishes your emotional response to pain will also be decreased by opioids. So they cause, I'll say, poor hypnosis. And they can produce GA, like a, um, a general anesthetic, at high doses. But these medications as a class in general are not very good at making you fully unconscious. And people can have quite a high dose of opioids before they lose awareness. Um, but what they do do... Uh, quite nicely is decrease your minimum alveolar concentration of gas. So they bring you closer to unconsciousness, but um, aren't the best medications to use on their own to establish general anesthetic. But your MAC can be decreased by up to 50% with opioids. They cause nausea and vomiting quite reliably, especially at the sort of analgesic dosing that we give. And that's via... Um, activation of the chemoreceptor trigger zone in the medulla, and also a little bit of increased vestibular sensitivity as well. Vestibular sensitivity. And the vestibular system is what is activated when you are motion sick. So uh, this can, if there is something making someone a little bit uh, sick from their vestibular system, uh, the effect of opioids may potentiate that. They cause meiosis, so I'll draw a normal pupil here. And then after a big dose of opioids, you'll get pupillary constriction, so pinpoint pupils. And this is actually quite useful um, in anesthesia because if we have someone who's under a general anesthetic and we're trying to wake them up, but maybe they're, they have delayed emergence, um, we can check their pupils to see if someone is over-narcotized. And if someone has pupils that look like this, there's a good chance that they have too much opioid on board, and perhaps that is the reason why they're not waking up. I should also say that they cause basically decreased sympathetic um, nervous system activity. And this is in part because of this altered sensory perception of noxious stimuli. So what would usually cause you to have a big sympathetic response no longer does, and then also um, does dampen the sympathetic outflow uh, it, it, itself. Let's jump over to sites of action before talking about resp and cardiovascular, just because I've alluded to a bunch of different areas where the opioids are acting. So let's just go from top to bottom here. First, we said that they can affect the cortex. And this would be them affecting your uh, state of consciousness and then uh, the way you process pain information and establish an emotional response to that. So I'll just draw an arrow affecting the cortex. Works at the midbrain as well. And specifically this area called the periaqueductal gray. And before we talk about this, let's just trace the um, path that no susceptive information would take getting to the brain. Um, so let's say that this is your tissue level here. And so this is a pain fiber that would carry information. So let's say you have some type of insult to the tissue here. This pain fiber gets activated. The information travels up through the dorsal root ganglion and then reaches the dorsal horn of the spinal cord where you also have this substantia gelatinosa. And then this pain information would cross over and enter the ventral horn where it will then ascend up through here and then 
up into the thalamus and to the cortex. So now this is the periaqueductal gray. This is an area just around the cerebral aqueduct in the midbrain. And when nociceptive information reaches this area, it can send descending inhibitory pathways down to your dorsal horn in the spinal cord. I should draw maybe an inhibitory arrow here. Um, and there are opioid receptors in this area. So opioids can bind to the cells in the periaqueductal gray and cause descending inhibitory signals to go down to the dorsal horn where no susceptive information enters the spinal cord. And then there will be less relay of this information over to the ventral horn and less going up. So that is the periaqueductal gray. Next we have the brain stem. And this is very important when it comes to the respiratory effects of opioids and a little bit for the cardiovascular effects. So just up in here, your respiratory drive centers are in your brainstem. So when we have respiratory depression, which we'll talk about from opioids, this is where that's acting. They'll work at the level of the spinal cord as well, and specifically we'll call this the substantia gelatinosa, which is the area in this dorsal horn that has opioid receptors. So there are specific areas in where uh, the nociceptive information would reach your spinal cord that has opioid receptors and can block that nociceptive information from making it further in this pathway. If you give a spinal dose of an opioid, you can be pretty assured that this is probably where it's acting in the, uh, in the substantia gelatinosa here. Then lastly, they also work peripherally. So we said that this was a pain fiber, and indeed there will be um, opioid receptors on pain fibers, so they can act peripherally, especially with sort of your low analgesic doses. This is probably what's happening to a degree, um, as well as, you know, it will, it will affect other things, but um, that's one of the effect of your low-dose analgesia.